Chapter 7 of Clover. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Clover by Susan Coolidge. Chapter 7 Making Acquaintance. Phil was better than his word. He was never uncivil to Mrs. Watson, and his distant manners, which really signified distaste, were set down by that lady to boyish shyness. They often are like that when they are young, she told Clover, but they get bravely over it after a while. He'll outgrow it, dear, and you mustn't let it worry you a bit. Meanwhile, Mrs. Watson's own flow of conversation was so ample that there was never any danger of awkward silences when she was present, which was a comfort. She had taken Clover into high favour now, and Clover deserved it, for, though she protected herself against encroachments, and resolutely kept the greater part of her time free for Phil, she was always considerate and sweet in manner to the older lady, and she found spare half-hours every day in which to sit and go out with her so that she should not feel neglected. Mrs. Watson grew quite fond of her young friend, though she stood a little in awe of her too, and was disposed to be jealous if any one showed more attention to Clover than to herself. An early outburst of this feeling came on the third day after their arrival, when Mrs. Hope asked Phil and Clover to dinner, and did not ask Mrs. Watson. She had discussed the point with her husband, but the doctor jumped on the idea forcibly, and protested that if that old thing was to come too, he would have a consultation in Pueblo, and be off on the 5.30 train, sure as fate. "'It's not that I care,' Mrs. Watson assured Clover plaintively. "'I've had so much done for me in all my life that, of course, but I do like to be properly treated.' "'It isn't as if I were just anybody. "'I don't suppose Mrs. Hope knows much about Boston society anyway, but still. "'And I should think a girl from South Framingham. "'Didn't you say she was from South Framingham? "'Would at least know who the Abraham Peabody's are, and their Henry's. "'But I don't imagine she was much of anybody before she was married. "'And out here it's all hail fellow and well met, they say.' "'though in that case I don't see... "'Well, well, it's no matter. "'Only it seems queer to me, "'and I think you'd better drop a hint about it when you're there, "'and just explain that my daughter lives next door "'to the lieutenant governor when she is in the country, "'and opposite the assistant bishop in town, "'and has one of the Harvard overseers for a near neighbour, "'and is distantly related to the Revere's.' "'You'd think even a South Framingham girl must know about the Lantern and the Old South, "'and how much they have always been respected at home.' "'Clover pacified her as well as she could, "'by assurances that it was not a dinner-party, "'and they were only asked to meet one girl whom Mrs. Hope wanted her to know. "'If it were a large affair, I am sure you would have been asked too,' she said, "'and so left her, old woman of the sea, partly consoled. It was the most lovely evening possible, as Clover and Phil walked down the street toward Dr. Hope's. Soft shadows lay over the lower spurs of the ranges. The canyons looked black and deep, but the peaks still glittered in rosy light. The mesa was in shadow, but the nearer plain lay in full sunshine, hot and yellow, and the west wind was full of mountain fragrance. Phil gave little skips as he went along. Already he seemed like a different boy. All the droop and languor had gone, and given place to an exhilaration which half frightened Clover, who had constant trouble in keeping him from doing things which she knew to be imprudent. Dr. Hope had warned her that invalids often harmed themselves by over-exertion under the first stimulus of the high air. Why? How queer she exclaimed stopping suddenly before one of the pretty places just above mrs marsh's boarding-house 
What? Don't you see? That yard. When we came by here yesterday, it was all green grass and rose bushes, and girls were playing croquet. And now, look, it's a pond. Sure enough, there were the rose bushes still, and the croquet arches, but they were standing, so to speak, up to their knees in pools of water, which seemed several inches deep and covered the whole place, with the exception of the flagged walks, which ran from the gates to the front and side doors of the house. Clover noticed now, for the first time, that these walks were several inches higher than the grass beds on either side. She wondered if they were made so on purpose, and resolved to notice if the next place had the same arrangement. But as they reached the next place, and the next, lo! The phenomenon was repeated, and Dr. Hope's lawn too was in the same condition. Everything was overlaid with water. They began to suspect what it must mean, and Mrs. Hope confirmed the suspicion. It was irrigation day in Mountain Avenue, it seemed. Every street in the town had its appointed period when the invaluable water, brought from a long distance for the purpose, was laid on and kept at a certain depth for a prescribed number of hours. "'We owe our grass and shrubs and flower-beds entirely to this arrangement,' Mrs. Hope told them. "'Nothing could live through our dry summers if we did not have the irrigating system.' "'Are the summers so dry?' asked Clover. "'It seems to me that we have had a thunderstorm almost every day since we came.' "'We do have a good many thunderstorms.' Mrs. Hope admitted, but we can't depend on them for the gardens. "'And did you ever hear such magnificent thunder?' asked Dr. Hope. "'Colorado thunder beats the world. Wait till you see our magnificent Colorado hail,' put in Mrs. Hope wickedly. "'That beats the world, too. It cuts our flowers to pieces and sometimes kills the sheep on the plains. We are very proud of it.' The doctor thinks everything in Colorado perfection. I've always pitied places which had to be irrigated, remarked Clover, with her eyes fixed on the little twin lakes which yesterday were lawns. But I begin to think I was mistaken. It's very superior, of course, to have rains. But then, at the east, we sometimes don't have rain when we want it, and the grass gets dreadfully yellow. Don't you remember, Phil? How hard Katie and I worked last summer to keep the geraniums and fuchsias alive in that long drought. Now, if we had had water like this to come once a week and make a nice deep pond for us, how different it would have been. Oh, you must come out west for real comfort, said Dr. Hope. The east is a dreadfully one-horse little place, anyhow. But you don't mean New York and Boston when you say one horse little place surely don't i said the undaunted doctor wait till you see more of us out here here's poppy at last cried mrs hope as a girl came hurriedly up the walk you're late dear poppy whose real name was marion chase was the girl who had been asked to meet them she was a tall rosy creature to whom clover took an instant fancy and seemed in perfect health. Yet she told them that when she came out to Colorado three years before, she had travelled on a mattress with a doctor and a trained nurse in attendance. "'Your brother will be as strong or stronger than I at the end of a year,' she said. "'Or if he doesn't get well as fast as he ought, you must take him up to the Ute Valley. That's where I made my first gain.' "'Where is the valley?' Thirty miles away to the northwest, up there among the mountains. It's a great deal higher than this, and such a lovely, peaceful place. I hope you'll go there. We shall, of course, if Phil needs it. But I like St. Helen so much that I would rather stay here if we can. Dinner was now announced, and Mrs. Hope led the way into a pretty room, hung with engravings and old plates after the modern fashion where a white spread table stood decorated with wild flowers, candlesticks with little red-shaded tapers, 
and a pyramid of plums and apricots. There was the usual succession of soup and fish and roast and salad, which one looks for at a dinner on the sea level, winding up with ice cream of a highly civilised description. But Clover could scarcely eat for wondering how all these things had come there so soon, so very soon. It seemed like magic. One minute the solemn peaks and passes, the prairie dogs and the thorny plain. The next, all these portieres and rugs and etchings and down pillows and pretty devices in glass and china, as if some enchanter's wand had tapped the wilderness and, hey presto, modern civilization had sprung up like Jonah's gourd all in a minute, or like the palace which Aladdin summoned into being in a single night for the occupation of the Princess of China by the rubbing of his wonderful lamp. And then, just as the fruit plates were put on the table, came a call, and the doctor was out in the hall, hollowing, and conducting with some distant patient one of those mysterious telephonic conversations which to those who overhear seem all replies and no questions. It was most remarkable, and quite unlike her preconceived ideas of what was likely to take place at the base of the Rocky Mountains. A pleasant evening followed. Poppy played delightfully on the piano. Later came a rubber of whist. It was like home. Before these children go, let us settle about the drive, said Dr. Hope to his wife. Oh, yes, Miss Carr. Oh, please, won't you call me Clover? Indeed I will. Clover, then. We want to take you for a good long drive tomorrow and show you something. But the trouble is, the doctor and I are at variance as to what the something shall be. I want you to see Odin's garden, and the doctor insists that you ought to go to the Cheyenne Canyons first, because those are his favourites. Now which shall it be? We will leave it to you. But how can I choose? I don't know either of them. What a queer name. Odin's garden? I'll tell you how to settle it cried Marion Chase, whose nickname it seemed had been given her because when she first came to St. Helen's she wore a bunch of poppies in her hat. Take them to Cheyenne tomorrow, and the next day, or Thursday, let me get up a picnic for Odin's garden, just a few of our special cronies, the Allens and the Blanchards and Mary Pelham and Will Amory. Will you, dear Mrs. Hope, and be our matron? That would be lovely. Mrs. Hope consented, and Clover walked home as if treading on air. Was this the St. Helens to which she had looked forward with so much dread? This gay, delightful place where such pleasant things happened and people were so kind? How she wished that she could get at Katie and Papa for five minutes on a wishing carpet or something to tell them how different everything was from what she had expected. One thing only marred her anticipations for the morrow, which was the fear that Mrs. Watson might be hurt and make a scene. Happily, Mrs. Hope's thoughts took the same direction, and by some occult process of influence, the use of which good wives understand, she prevailed on her refractory doctor to allow the old lady to be asked to join the party. So, early next morning came a very polite note, and it proposed that Phil should ride the doctor's horse and act as escort to Miss Chase, who was to go on horseback likewise. No proposal could have been more agreeable to Phil, who adored horses and seldom had the chance to mount one. So everyone was pleased and Mrs. Watson preened her ancestral feathers with great satisfaction. You see, dear, how well it was to give that little hint about the Reveres and the Abraham Peabodies, she said. Clover felt dreadfully dishonest, but she dared not confess that she had forgotten all about the hint, still less that she had never meant to give one. The better part of valour is discretion, she remembered. So she held her peace, 
though her cheeks glowed guiltily. At three o'clock they set forth in a light roomy carriage, not exactly a carry-all, but of the carry-all family, with a pair of fast horses, Miss Chase and Phil cantering happily alongside, or before, or behind, just as it happened. The sun was very hot, but there was a delicious breeze, and the dryness and elasticity of the air made the heat easy to bear. The way lay across and down the southern slope of the plateau on which the town was built. Then they came to splendid fields of grain and alfalfa, a cereal quite new to them, with broad, very green leaves. The roadside was gay with flowers, gilias and mountain balm, high pink and purple spikes, like foxgloves, which they were told were penstemons. Painter's brush, whose green tips seemed dipped in liquid vermilion, and masses of the splendid wild poppies. They crossed a foaming little river, and a sharp turn brought them into a narrower and wilder road, which ran straight toward the mountainside. This was overhung by trees, whose shade was grateful after the hot sun. Narrower and narrower grew the road, more and more sharp the turns. They were at the entrance of a deep defile, up which the road wound and wound, following the links of the river, which they crossed and recrossed repeatedly. Such a wonderful and perfect little river, with water clear as air and cold as ice, flowing over a bed of smooth granite, here slipping noiselessly down long slopes of rock, like thin films of glass, there deepening into pools of translucent blue-green, like aquamarine or beryl, again plunging down in mimic waterfalls, a sheet of iridescent foam. The sound of its rush and its ripple was like a laugh. Never was such happy water, Clover thought, as it curved and bent and swayed this way and that on its downward course, as if moved by some merry, capricious instinct, like a child dancing as it goes. Regiments of great ferns grew along its banks, and immense thickets of wild roses of all shades, from deep Jacquinot red to pale bush white. Here and there rose a lonely spike of yucca, and in the little ravines to right and left grew in the crevices of the rocks clumps of superb straw-coloured columbines four feet high. Looking up, Clover saw above the treetops strange pinnacles and spires and obelisks, which seemed air-hung, of purple-red and orange-tawny and pale pinkish-grey and terracotta, in which the sunshine and the cloud shadows broke in a multiplicity of wonderful half-tints. Above them was the dazzling blue of the Colorado sky. She drew a long, long breath. "'So this is a canyon,' she said. "'How glad I am that I have lived to see one.' "'Yes, this is a canyon,' Dr. Hope replied. "'Some of us think it is THE canyon, but there are dozens of others.' and no two of them are alike. I'm glad you are pleased with this, for it's my favourite. I wish your father could see it. Clover hardly understood what he said. She was so fascinated and absorbed. She looked up at the bright pinnacles, down at the flowers and the sheen of the river pools and the mad rush of its cascades, and felt as though she were in a dream. Through the dream she caught half-comprehended fragments of conversation from the seat behind. Mrs. Watson was giving her impressions of the scenery. "'It's pretty, I suppose,' she remarked. "'But it's so very queer, and I'm not used to queer things. And this road is frightfully narrow. If a load of hay or a big Concord coach should come along, I can't think what we should do.' I see that Dr. Hope drives carefully, but yet you don't think we shall meet anything of the kind today, do you, Doctor? Not a Concord coach, and certainly not a hay wagon, for they don't make hay up here in the mountains. Well, that is a relief. I didn't know, 
Ellen, she always says, Mother, you're a real fidget, but when one grows old and has valves in the heart as I have, you never... You might meet one of those big peddler's wagons, though, and they frighten horses worse than anything. Oh, what's that coming now? Let us get out, Dr. Hope. Pray, let us all get out. Sit still, ma'am, said the doctor sternly, for Mrs. Watson was wildly fumbling at the fastening of the door. Mary, put your arm round Mrs. Watson and hold her tight. There'll be a real accident, sure as fate, if you don't. Then, in a gentler tone, It's only a buggy, ma'am. There's plenty of room. There's no possible risk of a peddler's wagon. What on earth should a peddler be doing up here on the side of Cheyenne? Prairie dogs don't use pomatum or tinware. Oh, I didn't know, repeated poor Mrs. Watson nervously. She watched the buggy timorously till it was safely passed. Then her spirits revived. Well, she cried, we're safe this time, but I call it tempting providence to drive so fast on such a rough road. If all canyons are as wild as this, I shan't ever venture to go into another. Bless me, this is one of our mildest specimens, said Dr. Hope, who seemed to have a perverse desire to give Mrs. Watson a distaste for canyons. This is a smooth one, but some canyons are really rough. Do you remember, Mary, the day we got stuck up at the top of the Westmoreland and had to unhitch the horses, and how I stood in the middle of the creek, and yanked the carriage round while you held them. That was the day we heard the mountain lion, and there were fresh bear tracks all over the mud, you remember? Goodness gracious! cried Mrs. Watson, quite pale. What an awful place! Bears and lions! What on earth did you go there for? Oh, purely for pleasure, replied the doctor lightly. We don't mind such little matters out west. We try to accustom ourselves to wild beasts and make friends of them. John, don't talk such nonsense, cried his wife quite angrily. Mrs. Watson, you mustn't believe a word the doctor says. I've lived in Colorado nine years, and I've never once seen a mountain lion or a bear either, except the stuffed ones in the shops. Don't let the doctor frighten you. But Dr. Hope's wicked work was done. Mrs. Watson, quite unconvinced by these well-meant assurances, sat pale and awestruck, repeating under her breath, Dreadful! What will Ellen say? Bears and lions! Oh, dear me! Look, look! cried Clover, who had not listened to a word of this conversation. Did you ever see anything so lovely? She referred to what she was looking at a small point of pale, straw-coloured rock, some hundreds of feet in height, which a turn in the road had just revealed, soaring above the tops of the trees. "'I don't see that it's lovely at all,' said Mrs. Watson testily. "'It's unnatural, if that's what you mean. Rocks ought not to be that colour. They never are at the east. It looks to me exactly like an enormous, unripe banana.' standing on end. This simile nearly finished the party. It's big enough to disagree with all the Sunday schools in creation at once, remarked the doctor between his shouts, while even Clover shook with laughter. Mrs. Watson felt that she had made a hit and grew complacent again. See what your brother picked for me, cried Poppy, riding alongside and exhibiting a great sheaf of columbine tied to the pommel of her saddle. And how do you like North Cheyenne? Isn't it an exquisite place? Perfectly lovely. I feel as if I must come here every day. Yes, I know, but there are so many other places out here about which you have that feeling. Now we will show you the other Cheyenne Canyon, the twin of this said Dr. Hope, but you must prepare your mind to find it entirely different. After rather a rough mile or two through woods, they came to a wooden shed or shanty at the mouth of a gorge, 
and here Dr. Hope drew up his horses and helped them all out. "'Is it much of a walk?' asked Mrs. Watson. "'It is rather long and rather steep,' said Mrs. Hope. "'But it is lovely if you only go a little way in, "'and you and I will sit down the moment you feel tired "'and let the others go forward.' "'South Cheyenne Canyon was indeed entirely different. "'Instead of a green-floored, vine-hung ravine, "'it was a wild mountain gorge, "'walled with precipitous cliffs of great height, "'and its river, every canyon has a river, "'comes from a source at the top of the gorge in a series of mad leaps, forming seven waterfalls, which plunge into circular basins of rock, worn smooth by the action of the stream. These pools are curiously various in shape, and the colour of the water, as it pauses a moment to rest in each before taking its next plunge, is beautiful. Little plank walks are laid along the riverside, and rude staircases for the steepest pitches, up these the party went, leaving Mrs. Watson and Mrs. Hope far behind. Poppy, with her habit over her arm, Clover stopping every other moment to pick some new flower, Phil shying stones into the rapids as he passed, till the top of the topmost cascade was reached, and looking back they could see the whole wonderful way by which they had climbed, and down which the river made its turbulent rush. Clover gathered a great mat of green, scarlet, buried vine, like glorified cranberry, which Dr. Hope told her was the famous Kinnikinnick, and was just remarking on the cool water sounds which filled the place, when all of a sudden these sounds seemed to grow angry. The defile of precipices turned a frowning blue, and looking up they saw a great thundercloud gathering overhead. "'We must run!' cried Dr. Hope, and down they flew, racing at full speed along the long flights of steps and the plank walks, which echoed to the sound of their flying feet. Far below they could see two fast-moving specks, which they guessed to be Mrs. Hope and Mrs. Watson, hurrying to a place of shelter. Nearer and nearer came the storm, louder the growl of the thunder, and great hailstones pattered on their heads before they gained the cabin. None too soon, for in another moment the cloud broke, and the air was full of a dizzy whirl of sleet and rain. Others beside themselves had been surprised in the ravine, and every few minutes another and another wet figure would come flying down the path, so that the little refuge was soon full. The storm lasted half an hour, then it scattered as rapidly as it had come, the sun broke out brilliantly, and the drive home would have been delightful if it had not been for the sad fact that Mrs. Watson had left her parasol in the carriage, and it had been wet, and somewhat stained by the India rubber blanket which had been thrown over it for protection. Her lamentations were pathetic. Jane Phillips gave it to me. She was a Samson, you know and I thought ever so much of it. It was at Hovey's. We were there together, and I admired it, and she said, Mrs. Watson, you must let me... Six dollars was the price of it. That's a good deal for a parasol, you know, unless it's a really nice one. But Hovey's things are always... I had the handle shortened a little, just before I came away too, so that it would go into my trunk. It had to be mended anyhow, so that it seemed a good... Dear, dear, now it's spoiled. What pity I left it in the carriage. I shall know better another time, but this climate is so different. It never rains in this way at home. It takes a little while about it, and gives notice. And we say that there's going to be a nor'easter, or that it looks like a thunderstorm, and we put on our second-best clothes, or we stay at home. It's a great deal nicer, I think. I'm so sorry said kind little Mrs. Hope. Our storms out here do come up very suddenly. I wish I had noticed that you had left your parasol. Well, Clover, you've had a chance now to see the doctor's beautiful Colorado hail and thunder to perfection. How do you like them? I like everything in Colorado, I believe, replied Clover, laughing. I won't even accept the hail, 
"'She's the girl for this part of the world,' cried Dr. Hope approvingly. "'She'd make a first-rate pioneer. "'We'll keep her out here, Mary, and never let her go home. "'She was born to live at the West.' "'Was I? "'It seems queer, then, that I should have been born to live in Burnett. "'Oh, we'll change all that. "'I'm sure I don't see how.' There are ways and means, oracularly. Mrs. Watson was so cast down by the misadventure to her parasol that she expressed no regret at not being asked to join in the picnic next day, especially as she understood that it consisted of young people. Mrs. Hope very rightly decided that a whole day out of doors, in a rough place, would give pain rather than pleasure to a person who was both so feeble and so fussy, and did not suggest her going. Clover and Phil waked up quite fresh and untired after a sound night's sleep. There seemed no limit to what might be done and enjoyed in that in inexhaustibly renovating air. Odin's garden proved to be a wonderful assemblage of rocky shapes rising from the grass and flowers of a lonely little plain on the far side of the Mesa, four or five miles from St. Helens. The name of the place came probably from something suggestive in the forms of the rocks, which reminded Clover of pictures she had seen of Assyrian and Egyptian rock carvings. There were lion shapes and bull shapes, like the rudely chiselled gods of some heathen worship. There were slender points and obelisks three hundred feet high, and something suggesting a cat-faced deity, and queer similitudes of crocodiles and apes all in the strange orange and red and pale yellow formations of the region. It was a wonderful rather than a beautiful place, but the day was spent very happily under those mysterious stones which, as the long afternoon shadows gathered over the plain and the sky glowed with sunset crimson which seemed like a reflection from the rocks themselves, became more mysterious still. Of the merry young party which made up the picnic, seven out of nine had come to Colorado for health, but no one would have guessed it. They seemed so well and so full of the enjoyment of life. Altogether, it was a day to be marked, not with a white stone, that would not have seemed appropriate to Colorado, but with a red one. Clover, writing about it afterward to Elsie, felt that her descriptions to sober stay-at-homes might easily sound overdrawn and exaggerated, and wound up her letter thus. Perhaps you think that I am romancing, but I am not a bit. Every word I say is perfectly true. Only I have not made the colours half bright, or the things half beautiful enough. Colorado is the most beautiful place in the world. N.B. Clover had seen but a limited portion of the world so far. I only wish you could all come out to observe for yourselves that I am not fibbing, though it sounds like it. End of chapter 7